I'm Alex Michelson. This week, the issue is vaccine mandates. Should California's kids be required to get vaccinated to attend in-person classes? Top Democratic lawmakers want to make that a reality. Here to debate that and more, Ethan Bierman on the left, Michael Knowles on the right. Plus, the issue is two California teams matching up for the right to play in California's Super Bowl. Arash Markazi and his dance moves are back to break it all down and maybe dance some more too. The issue is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. This week, two of our returning champions are back for a rematch. We are overdue for an Issue Is debate this week. Our big issues, vaccine mandates and President Biden. With us, Ethan Bierman, a proud progressive. He is the founder of the Bierman Law Firm and a cable news veteran. Fun fact, his daughter Shiloh is a successful Hollywood actress. Michael Knowles is the host of The Michael Knowles Show at The Daily Wire, The Book Club at PragerU, and Verdict with Ted Cruz podcast. He's also a best-selling author and a cigar aficionado. Michael and Ethan were both on our set together in March of 2020, our last show with in-studio guests for almost two years. Well, now we are back via Zoom due to the Omicron variant, how the world has changed since that moment. Ethan, Michael, welcome back to The Issue Is. Great Thanks to be so. with you, Alex. All right, so let's start the big debate in Sacramento, which is over vaccines and kids. State Senator Richard Pan, who also happens to be a pediatrician, is pushing legislation to require all California kids to be vaccinated in order to attend in-person schools. This would start in January of next year. He would get rid of the personal belief exemption for vaccines, but a medical exemption would remain. I spoke with Dr. Pan this week on the Fox 11 News special report. Here's some of that. Those families, they deserve the right to know that when they send their child to school, their child will be safe and that when they come home, they're not going to bring a disease that may actually uh, harm or even uh, kill uh, someone in their family. But doctor, we know now with the Omicron variant that the vaccines are not stopping uh, people who have been vaccinated from either getting COVID or spreading COVID. Certainly vaccines alone uh, are not going to completely stop transmission. That's why we still need to continue other mitigation measures like masks and doing testing and good ventilation. Let's start this off with Michael. What do you think of this proposal? Well, I think your question was quite apt, Alex, because the reasoning that the state senator is giving uh, will not be accomplished by the, the vaccine mandates. They, as you say, don't stop the spread. They don't stop infection. We know that the infection fatality rate for kids from all forms of COVID, and especially from this most mild form, the Omicron variant, is extremely low. You're looking at uh, about 400 uh, deaths of kids under 18, uh, per year since the, the pandemic began. And when you factor in severe comorbidities, it's probably significantly lower than that. That is much less than deaths from cancer. That's much less than deaths among children from heart disease. It's about on par with the flu and with pneumonia. So it do doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Plus there are some, some genuine concerns here. Belgium, for instance, just stopped recommending the Moderna vaccine for people under 31, all the way under 31, to say nothing of kids who are much, much younger because of fears of myocarditis side effects. Uh, there are other side effects as well, including nerve damage and, and other things. So it, it just seems to me to be a, a, a solution that will not solve the problem that it is supposed to solve and could cause a lot of other problems as well. Ethan, your thoughts? Yeah, well, I obviously disagree with Mr. Knowles on this one. Look, so 400 dead kids don't matter to the right anymore. Why have vaccines? <laughs> I don't um, think I said that. So, so myocarditis, by the way, since Michael focused on that, is a very important one. What they have found is those who get the vaccine and have a minor case of myocarditis that is quickly resolved is unlike those 
who get COVID without the vaccine, and it's a severe myocarditis that results, let alone the difference between reduced infection from those who get the vaccine and the fact that we already require vaccines for children to attend school for things like polio, MMR, DTaP. There are so many vaccines that are already required. This is par for the course to protect our children in the community. And it's important to note the science is overwhelmingly in favor of taking a multi-layered approach like Dr. Pan talked about. And as long as there is still medical exemptions allowed, then I think that that's the right move for community protection. Because I don't want my child coming home and transmitting it to my grandparent and then them passing away. It, it's just called basic safety and precaution because we live in a community. Is this basic safety, Michael? This is not basic safety, and it actually is a whole lot of risk. So what Ethan's argument here relies on is following the science and the scientific expertise. The problem is that the science has changed rapidly and contradicted itself. The public health authorities, specifically on this issue of COVID, no longer have credibility. They have held both sides of the masking issue. They held both sides of the vaccine issue. We were told by Dr. Fauci, Rochelle Walensky at the CDC, Joe Biden, that the vaccines absolutely would stop infection and transmission, then they told us that that was not true. We were told that there were no side effects. I'll give you an example, not no side effects whatsoever, but a very specific one. We were told by the public health experts that the vaccines could not alter a woman's menstrual cycle. There was no effect. It defied the science, one doctor told us. And then one study proved that wasn't true. I'm not saying that the effect on something like a woman's menstrual cycle is necessarily huge. I'm not saying it's many days or many weeks. What I'm saying is that things that we were told were not scientifically possible possible turned out to, to be happening. And so because there are no long-term data here, because the infection fatality rate is so extraordinarily low, contrary to Ethan's, I think, uncharitable and unfair suggestion that the right doesn't care about kids dying, I think the observation we're making is that you're never going to obliterate illness specifically from schools. And so when you're looking at deaths and sicknesses here that are on par with the flu and on par with pneumonia, that, that I, we might not want to engage in a mass vaccination campaign for, for an un basically untested technology. Ethan? I couldn't disagree more. Um, the point here is simple. If you can prevent deaths, prevent them. If you can have a minor symptomatic side effect versus being intubated or dying, these are dramatically different things. Michael is misrepresenting what happens with science. Science is very simple. We take data, we analyze the data against a a, a thesis, a hypothesis, and then we change based on new data. What Michael just described as being double-sided or flip-flopping or what is a is is a lie. That's how science works. When new data comes in and refutes previous data, that's called science. And then changing what the recommendation is based on the new data is exactly how science works. This is not politics. Politics is flip-flopping, <laughs> whereas one day I care about kids, so by golly, we have to ban abortion. And the next day is I don't really care about kids when they're dying with something that's preventable, or I'm going to remove the ability for women to have access to health care. Yeah. So we really care about well, kids. No, no. We know there's been a lot there's been a lot of politics in COVID from both sides <laughs> on this since it began. But but Ethan, I, I have a question about the enforcement of this, right? So L.A. Unified, the biggest district in California, tried to do this and ended up having to punt on it because so few kids uh, did it. They were worried about uh, having thousands of kids out of school. Uh, we've seen this in other school districts around the state as well. Are you concerned about actually enforcing this and potentially sending thousands of kids to in, you know, remote learning again? Yes. I actually am very concerned about that. I'm concerned that we have places like a children's museum in Colorado closed because angry parents misled by the right won't put on a mask, um, shutting down a children's museum. We have a butterfly center in Texas closed due to terroristic threats from angry parents. It's the parents, it's not the kids who are the issue here. Parents who are being, uh, overwrought with emotion due to misleading information from the right, or in some cases, outright lies. But look, I am most concerned about the kids. I think kids are way more resilient than we give them credit for. Kids aren't the ones who have issues with masks. Parents do. 
Um, kids aren't the ones who have issues with getting a vaccine, parents do. So the issue here, and I agree with you, I'm concerned that forcing a vaccine mandate, a COVID vaccine mandate is gonna lead to kids. I think Dr. Pan might be wrong on this one. And I think that we're gonna have to do things like focus on the ventilation systems and enforcing the mask mandates more than enforcing a vaccine right now. All right, we're going to have to leave it there, uh, but we are going to have more with this panel when we come back. Up next, after year one, President Biden's poll numbers are down, down, down. So what can he do to turn things around? When will things come around? More with Ethan and Mike when we come back. You're watching The Issue Is. historic candidate someone who's worthy of Justice Breyer's legacy. President Biden will be nominating a successor to California's own Stephen Breyer, who has served on the Supreme Court for nearly 30 years. One of the justices on the, of the California Supreme Court is among the potential nominees to replace him. That announcement may give President Biden a political lifeline at a time when he's struggling at the polls. Back with our panel on the right, Michael Knowles of The Daily Wire. But let's begin with progressive attorney Ethan Behrman. Ethan. What letter grade would you give President Biden one year on and why? Oh, wow. I would give him a B plus, And I would give that because he got infrastructure passed. He reduced childhood poverty by roughly one third in the United States. We have a record GDP growth, record number of jobs added. We have unemployment under 4%. Um, we have alliances back in line globally with our traditional allies. Um, we have progress happening regarding uh, uh, climate change and issues therein. And he's been working on restoring uh, the federal courts with uh, good ju judicial pitches, uh, excuse me, judicial picks. So I think he's a B plus, And I think there's a lot of positives that um, I think the media likes to not focus on. Let me guess, Michael's grade not going to be quite as kind. <laughs> Not quite there. I'm glad that I've discovered the last man in America who seems to approve of the job that Joe Biden is doing, because the polling shows that the vast majority of Americans do not. I would give him a D. The reason I don't give him an F is because he has not yet plunged us into a massive war, though it appears that he might be able to do that as we look at the crisis in Ukraine. Speaking of war, obviously, there was the disaster in Afghanistan, which was largely his fault because of the timetables that he insisted on because of his refusal to hold the Bagram Air Base before he evacuated the rest of the country. He didn't evacuate the rest of the country. He left a lot of Americans behind. Speaking of foreign issues, there's the border. Uh, this is the absolute worst year for illegal border crossings in at least 20 years, if not ever. Those aren't my words. Those were the words that were caught on tape of Joe Biden's uh, secretary of of the Department of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas. Inflation is at a 40-year high. Biden doesn't own that entire problem, but he does own a lot of it because of his policies on energy, on easy money, and on the lockdown, the mandates creating a labor shortage, which of course is going to send uh, send prices going up. And uh, and then there's th his admitted failures on COVID. That was the one issue that Joe Biden had been above water on, and uh, that the people still supported him on. And he's flopped on that too. Joe Biden began his presidency by saying, "I'm going to shut down the virus." What did he say just a few weeks ago? There's no federal solution. He's admitting that Trump was actually right in the approach. To, to the virus. So I think it's basically an unmitigated disaster. And the whole purpose of this Supreme Court nomination is to try to give him one victory after the failure of almost his entire legislative agenda. I mean, Ethan, whatever you think of everything of what Michael just said, uh, we know that the polls do show that President Biden is underwater right now and that Democrats are not in a good position going into the midterms. The president's only got a few months to really get some sort of legislation through. What do you think is the most important thing that he needs to do to turn things around politically? Well, I think the most important thing for the Democrats to do that will help in the midterms is to figure out what the right compromise looks like for the Build Back Better agenda. I mean, it was uh, Joe Manchin who single-handedly uh, torpedoed that legislation. So it's a matter of figuring out what needs to happen there. Look, it's not anywhere near as bad as you guys are making it out to be. First off, he's multiple points ahead of where the former guy was at this stage in his presidency as well. He's polling better than him. Um, the special elections that have happened over the last several months have gone overwhelmingly for Democrats. 
So I think that there are lots of positive things happening for the Democrats. But my biggest thing is figuring out how they get at least some portion of Build Back Better passed. And it seems like a lot of that would be listening to Joe Manchin and say, what do you want to do? And then doing that. Uh, so, Michael, one minute. Uh, I know you, you're not a fan of President Biden, but if he could do something to turn things around, what would that be? If he could do one thing to turn things around, I would say it would be to resign. But actually, that's oh. the best p political advantage that Biden has going for him. Because <laughs> though he is extraordinarily unpopular, his approval ratings are around 30, his vice president is somehow even less popular. Quite an accomplishment. She's around 27 percent. And so, th yes, the best thing he's got going for him is that he's the most popular guy in an extremely unpopular administration. Well, well I, I think the joke there, by the way, is if if both Biden and Kamala Harris go, guess what? You guys get President Pelosi, and I know that the Republicans <laughs> like her even less. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's true. That would be fun. All right. Uh, well, uh, and either real quick to either one of you, do you think there's any chance that Kamala Harris gets appointed to the Supreme Court? Zero. S slim but unlike uh, slim but possible. Yeah, uh, we will see what happens on that front. Um, but it is always great to hear from both of you. We really do appreciate your perspective. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there. Real quickly, also, Rams, Niners, who do you got? Rams by 10. I think the, I think the Yankees by 50. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, up next, Arash Markazi is with us to talk about California Super Bowl. I don't think the Yankees are going to make it. Uh, but before we go to break, we've got some music from the newest Super Bowl halftime show trailer. This is very cool. And a chance for Michael and Ethan to showcase their dance moves. Take away, Snoop. I actually love this song. Hold up. Obviously going to have a big contingent of, of Ram fans there that uh, should be a lot of fun. When you could get your fans behind you like that on a road game, and you, we knew it, I mean, before the game even started, there was a lot of red. You could see it. The quarterbacks for the San Francisco 49ers and L.A. Rams talking about the fact that so many San Franciscans took over SoFi Stadium in Inglewood to root for their team the last time the two teams face off. This week, again, the NFC Championship. Here to talk about it is Arash Markazi. <laughs> Arash is one of the best followers in all of sports journalism. He's the host of the Arash Markazi Show on the Mightier 1090 ESPN Radio. You can read his work at themorningcolumn.com. Arash joins us right now from an Uber in the middle of a snowstorm. <laughs> in New York. He was supposed to be at a different place but got stuck behind traffic. So thanks to technology, he can join us. Let's hope this signal holds. Arash, welcome back to The Issue Is. Thank you. You know, the truth of the matter is parking is so much at SoFi Stadium this weekend. I am trying to find a parking spot. $500, $600. Let's do this, Alex. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about this game. Why have we seen so many more San Francisco fans buy tickets for this game, buy tickets for the last game? How can the Rams not get more people in their own stadium? Hey, Alex, we're the same age. No one who is below the age of 40 grew up a Los Angeles Rams fan. The Rams were in St. Louis for 21 years, and the price you have to pay for that, you do not have diehard, hardcore fans that will be paying $1,000 for a ticket. That is not something that's possible. That's not going to happen. Rams fans are, they do exist. There are Rams fans, but will they pay $1,000? And I just mentioned this before, $700 to park the car for the game on Sunday. That is not going to happen. So unfortunately, you will have more 49er fans there Sunday than Los Angeles Rams fans. All right, so we are, of course, taping this before the game. Some people will see this after the game. Who wins the game? I think the Rams do. I totally get it. They've lost six straight times. They've been swept the last three seasons. They lost the last game of the season. The Rams are the better team. The Rams are the superior team. This is the only game that matters. No one cares about the last six games. If they win it on Sunday, all the work that they did, they went all in to go to the Super Bowl this year. It's all about playing at SoFi Stadium. Two weeks from Sunday, they want to play in that Super Bowl. You know, a lot of fans thought that last weekend was the best weekend of football ever. The ratings really yeah. threw the roof. It, it seems like in the midst of this pandemic, we all need something to celebrate. We need some joy. And this is finally some good news. Talk about the, the sort of the role of sports in getting us through all of this. Sports has always been 
the escape for us, Alex. No matter what we're going through in life, we have sports. That's why at the beginning of the pandemic, it was so hard because we didn't even have sports. And then when we got sports back, we got sports back without fans. And we truly appreciated how much the fans meant. How much this Sunday, 70,000 fans at SoFi Stadium, what that means. Sports gives us that that. that time away from the real world where we don't have to worry about what we're going through with our life with, 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 with our job we want to watch football and you were right last weekend was the best saturday of football the best sunday best weekend of football we've had in a long long time and don't have to worry about things like being stuck in an uber in a snowstorm uh <laughs> exactly. next up is the super bowl at sofi and in the years ahead, SoFi and, and California really generally will be at the center of the sports universe. This is something you've written a lot about. Listen, the reason that they built this $5 billion palace is not just to host the Super Bowl. It's the college football championship game, which will be here a year from now. The World Cup in 2026, the Olympics in 2028. And I'm hearing we're going to get the Super Bowl right, right back in 2027. All these events are coming to Los Angeles because of SoFi. And, and that's just SoFi, not to mention Dodger Stadium and, and crypto and all the other places that are going to be at the yeah. center of the sports world as well. All right, Arash, we've got more of the issue is after the break. But we want to go to break with more of the trailer for the Super Bowl halftime show. You know we'd never forget about Dre, right? And Arash, this is a chance to see those moves in the car. Yes, he's back. Stay. Can you tell we're just a little bit excited for the Super Bowl halftime show at SoFi Stadium? Over the next few weeks, we'll be on top of all the big political controversies, of course. But we're also going to have some fun with the biggest sports and cultural event in all of America happening right here in our backyard. We end this week with the shot of SoFi Stadium and one of our favorite songs, Go Rams.